the stars be with you. All right. I'm so happy to welcome my guest this week, Jack Marsh. Thank you so much for joining me again on the podcast. It is a pleasure to be here, Mel. Oh my gosh. I can say the same. I was so excited to, um, I've been having some repeat guests back because, you know, when you bring a guest on and they're really good, you know, <laughs> why not bring them back? And Jack was someone I wanted to get back here uh, ASAP. If I could talk to Jack every week, you know, I'd be happy, really. <laughs> um, so tell us a little bit about yourself, Jack, just in case people hadn't seen an episode before. Yeah, well, um, my name is Jack. I live in the DC area. I um, uh, have a website that is relaunching on Wednesday, the 20th in the morning. We'll talk about that later with a beautiful electional chart. Um, that is GeminiJack.com, and you can still reach me at GeminiJack at gmail.com. And uh, I provide uh, astrological consultations, tarot consultations. I actually just got my uh, first few levels of Reiki training done. I'm getting my master certification here at the end of October, which has been super wonderful and powerful and profound. And I worked some music festivals this summer, uh, with some of my friends that were teaching yoga and I was there giving tarot and astrological consultations and it really opened a lot of wonderful doors and now I just am working now at uh, Lotus City Yoga in Lovettsville, uh, Virginia, I'm a little north of where I live um, and I'm on the sublist at another studio and I do a monthly charity event that raises money for pet adoption. So I do a lot of stuff and then I have, you know, I have a day job too that involves uh, home staging for the real estate market. Oh, I love it. And how Gemini Jack is that? Gemini <laughs> is all over the place in a good way. You know, the Jack, Jack of all trades. Did they name that for you? <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm glad you're so busy and getting out there and getting around because, you know, you have wonderful insights and you need to be doing these types of things because I think you have a lot to share for people. And hence why I asked you to come back here and talk with me and share all this wonderful knowledge. Um, and what we're going to be talking about today is seasonal change, the Libran equinox. Um, I had to be specific about the, uh, you know, I, I started with the autumnal equinox and I'm like, wait that hemispheres, not everyone has the autumnal. <laughs> and so I settled with the Libran. Um, so we will talk a little bit about the equinox, a little bit about Libra, a little bit about this week and, you know, cause there's a lot going on and we're also waxing towards that uh, full harvest moon in Aries, which really ties into the whole Libra theme as well. Um, so yeah, Jack, let's start with that equinox um, and what it, what it is. Do you want to, go in there and tell people some little tidbits? Sure. Well, the equinoxes are fabulous times of the year because those are the turning points of where the light and the darkness proportionally in the day are approximately equal, right? So during the solstice, we have either the summer solstice, uh, whichever hemisphere you're in, in which the, the days are overcoming the nights, and then the winter solstice, which would, of course, be in Capricorn, zero degrees of Capricorn in the northern hemisphere. Uh, that is when the darkness is of a larger proportion than the day. But the equinoxes are these really magical times of year where the day and the night are, are sort of evenly matched or equal. The yin and the yang are really in high synergy together. And it's a really great time if you... Uh, have some faith-based practices to do uh, prayer work, meditation, magical rituals, whatever it is that fits within your personal philosophy of how the world works and how the universe works together. And it's a, also a, a wonderful time to uh, see how we are at balance with the world around us. Um, in the Kabbalah, for example, uh, the first day of Libra or the autumnal equinox is called the day of partnership. And it's a, a the day during the year where we're supposed to be able to feel or experience more fully how we're part of dynamic partnerships and systems within our lives rather than just shining our light for ourselves. 
Oh, I love that. I didn't know that there was an association there with the, the Kabbalah. That seems so fitting uh, for the equinox, but of course for Libra, um, which we'll talk about <laughs> here in a little bit. Um, but yeah, it really just marks, well, the equinoxes are so important um, as Western astrologers and, you know, tropical, the tropical zodiac, because basically these equinoxes, these points of equal day and equal night are essentially what set up our whole zodiacal system, at least for Western astrology, um, because we mark that Aries point, uh, even though, you know, the constellation of Aries has moved in the sky over thousands of years, you know, we're still marking that point based on the relation of the sun and the moon and when they meet um, in that equilibrium that we're talking about. Um, so it's so important. These, so because it's important, you know, like what it, it, it's, when we think of seasons, we think of change, right? Something's changing. Yeah. And so here we are changing again. Um, and so unlike that spring equinox, um, that is kind of like that, you know, the, the spring equinox is like when the starting gun, when the, you know, when the athlete takes off and starts running and, like, you know, much like the plants that start growing, like we're onto something, we're moving forward. The day is getting uh, greater, like you were saying. Um, and then that autumn equinox we then kind of we kind of reach the finish line in some ways and rest and kind of have to repose um I, I think so yeah it's all about that changing of the seasons i mean have you noticed anything over in your area because i mean our seasons don't change <laughs> in california <laughs> well i'm a native californian myself i grew up in around san francisco so i growing up i was like oh so it must be between 68 and 75 degrees all year every year and you have a green season and a, and a brown dry season right mm. and of course then i moved to the east coast and seeing the whole flux of all four seasons you just you get an extra cyc cyclical knowledge and if we're getting in touch with the autumnal equinox this time of year represented when the harvest was happening, right? Mm -hmm. So suddenly, people's individual jobs became less significant. Everyone had to get together to get the crops off the vine and stored properly for the winter season that was upcoming. So in a very literal sense, this became about a time of sharing, of partnership, like the hands coming together to reap the field and milk the cows and all the, all the things you need to do to prep. You know, get uh, make jams out of your berries, all these things. <laughs> make jams out of your berries. <laughs> I love a good jam. Let's not. <laughs> yeah, I'm right there with you. I love some jam, especially raspberry. <laughs> oh, girl, that is my favorite, followed by blue. Okay. But, um, I'm right there with you. Oh, of course we like each other so much. You, mix it up, you get that wild berry. Anyway, we digress. Yes. <laughs> This show is about to jam. <laughs> we're we're going to go into the details of jams. Um, yes, <laughs> that's right. Oh my gosh. So yeah, you know, it's, it's, I, sometimes I wish I lived in a place where I could really take part in the changes and feel them because I know that people that live in those areas and something that you're experiencing, it really is like just a, you feel the change more on a kind of visceral level within everything around you and your own modes. And so it, when you don't have those changes, it's almost like, like you still feel it inside because, you know, these are essentially our seasons are pivot points, right? Much like the kind of the cardinal houses, where things start to move and go forward. And um, I, I like how there, I read that there's kind of like, the pivot points can create turbulence in our lives because things are starting and, and moving forward again. Mm -hmm. But it, it's not really like a, like a distressing turbulence. It's more like a kind of exciting and exhilarating and things are changing and, and oh, we're a little nervous about it, but we're just going to go with it and, and, and make it happen. Um, and so, yeah, I'm a little jealous of those seasons. You'll have to send me some pictures. <laughs> oh, sure. When the tree in my front yard turns like beautiful yellow and gold and uh, like auburn orangey hues i'll send you a little snapchat girl you know you'll be <laughs> I know it. i'll just be like living vicariously <laughs> yeah. and, well the other aspect to the autumnal equinox which you know one of the core ideas of astrology is the idea of dignity and the sun is in its two debilitating dignities uh so debilitation and fall when it is in libra and then aquarius mm -hmm. and so in my early years of astrological study, I always wondered, like, what does it mean for the sun to be in fall or for the sun to be debilitated? And over time studying, you come to notice patterns of how the, the light of the, sh of the sun 
shines differently or for different reasons than, it, than the typical solar principle during the Libra time and the Aquarius time. Uh, just to mention it briefly and then move on to Libra, uh, the Aquarian light of the sun is at the time where the Earth is physically most distant from our solar principle. And therefore, it, it feels sort of like, uh, like the sun shining on the side of the Himalayas in winter. It's bright and it's clear, but there's something cold and distant about it mm -hmm. uh, or aloof. Not cold in terms of like a Saturnian, uh, like blocking quality, but cold in the fact that it feels aloof and distant. And even though it's shining, it does somehow lacks a level of radiance. Mm -hmm. um, meanwhile, Libra, it is, uh, this is like the lowest point for the sun, if you will, in terms of its application to the solar principle, because the sun loves to be seen, right? The sun shines for itself to nourish others, but ultimately it's an egoish uh, principle of uh, how can I shine, uh, shine and be seen in the world and how can maybe that nurture others, but it still returns back to what is shining, which is the sun. Libra shines not just for Librans, but it shines for all of humankind. It's the socialist place, if you will, in the zodiac for the sun. It shines for all, not just for one. And sometimes when you're the sun, you need to shine just for yourself. But the Libra energy automatically makes it more egalitarian, even when that's not helpful to the principle at hand. Mm. Um, so it's a deeply needed quality of energy in the world. But if you're an individual, it sometimes leaves you feeling... But what about what makes me special? And that is a really interesting thing to integrate. And uh, I think it's something that we all need to bear in mind as we enter into Libra season is, how can I shine best, not just for myself, but for others? It's a moment where we can expand our solar principle to be much more inclusive. But we do also need to remember, how can the way I serve others also... Um, also serve myself in a meaningful spiritual way, just like, uh, you know, when the airline stewardess tells, or steward, stewardess, uh, air, um, uh, <laughs> whatever flight, it's called these days. <laughs> um, the flight attendant, there we are. There we are. When they fasten your seatbelt before you assist others, sometimes in the Libra principle, we have to remember, oh, I need to fasten my seatbelt too. Yes. Um, That's no. a very cancer thing too. I've noticed, you know, you got to put the oxygen mask on, uh, before, you know, your own, before you start aiding other people, because otherwise, you know, how are you going to help if you know, you're, if you're, if you're like, your light's dying basically, and you don't have that oxygen to be able to help, um, you know, the person that you're, you know, trying to, to help because Libra is very much associated with the other person. But before I go there, I kind of want to uh, talk about your, your Himalayan um, observation, because if we think about it, we're talking about seasons, you know, we're going from summer, which is hot and dry to uh, fall, which is cold and dry. Um, and so where we were waxing in that, that hot and dry energy of the summer, you know, there's where we get that kind of uh, that coldness, that crispness that you're saying, um, but also kind of that aloofness that, that the dry can bring and that earth, that earthy type of energy. You know, even though we're in an air sign, uh, while we're in Libra, Scorpio, um, and Sagittarius, there's more of a cold and dry type of feel to the energy. So I liked your uh, analogy with that. <laughs> yeah, beautifully said. And that totally, for those that, um, uh, that may not know, that absolutely fits also into the... Uh, the, the beautiful lunar cycle, and you've just applied some wonderful lunar wisdom to the solar cycle. So as the light in the in proportion in the daytime, and again, astrology is typically done from the perspective of the northern hemisphere, but that is actually factually because, you know, 80% of human population throughout all of history has existed in the northern hemisphere. It's sort of where the energetic focus of the cerebral concept is on the planet. Mm. Yeah. Um, and so regardless of which hemisphere you live in, there is sort of a, an upward correlation to that feeling in terms of a northerly direction, um, which is, yeah, it, it doesn't matter where you live on the earth. Yeah. Uh, beautiful people. Well, you know, and so, so last night I was at, um, we had our San Diego Astrological Society meeting. We had a wonderful speaker, Armin Diaz. If you've heard of him before, he's a relationship astrologer primarily. 
um, from New York. And uh, we at the end of the at the end of the talk, we just started talking about Libra a little bit and how. Um, you know, we associate Libra with relationships, which yes, that that is very applicable, most certainly. Um, but it it kind of morphed itself into that expression um, because really Libra is is about is about the relationship in the way of um, much like a general uh, would work with other generals of an army. You know, where that diplomatic response, where we're trying to find an equilibrium between ideas and concepts and meeting in the middle to what's fair for all parties, so that you can unite and be and be one. And so that's a very Libran principle uh, there. And I think that's how it kind of morphed into the idea of relationships through that more diplomatic and, um, you know, negotiating and kind of tactful process that Libra has within it. So. Beautifully said, Mel. Absolutely. But now we all just talk about relationships. Libra rolls around and we're like, oh, relationship time. Let's... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. It sort of it sort of fits into, I mean, I, I, you know, an astrologer is not wrong to talk about relationships a lot during yeah. the season, because it's all about when we're returning from the externally, you know, extroverted summer period, and we're returning to the home and our patterns of behavior with partners, either best friends, sibling-like people, and uh, romantic partners. Mm -hmm. um, but this focus of turning inward during the Libra season Oh, oh heavens, you know when you have a really beautiful thought and then it fades away? Oh, all the time. <laughs> all the time. I wish I could just grab up into this the atmosphere and just grab it back down. And like I I tend to when that happens to me, I like reverse engineer it and I'll go back from thought to thought until I get <laughs> Um, but you know, the pressure of actually recording something in the moment, will it'll, <laughs> it'll make things go away. <laughs> oh. It's important. It'll return to me. So absolutely. It will. And so, yes, cause we're talking, kind of talking about that Libra energy and how it morphed into that relationship sign. And I, you're absolutely right. It's not wrong to talk about relationships when it comes to Libra, because like you were saying with the sun, you know, especially being in, um, in a fall position there um libra really finds itself through the other like that's where it's it like projects that light so that it can then understand it and understand itself truly and that's where that wonderful venusian principle comes in as well because venus yeah it's beauty but what is beauty in a sense that everyone can receive beauty because beauty in a torah in a taurus sense can be more about a beautiful thing or being something precious and uh, rare, but beauty from a Libran perspective is beauty as it can be received by all peoples. And so there is this element of Libra where it's like a beauty of ideals and principle, and it might be less physically, objectively beautiful than Taurus, but there is a, a level of the beauty of Libra that can be received by more people than the beauty of Taurus. Um, and I have some wonderful Libra Moon people in my life. My brother, actually quite funny, all the Libra Moon people that I know are middle children, which is such a weird, funky coincidence that the, that the, 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 the one that wants, seeks balance and equilibrium at heart in their lunar principle is the middle child, right? So <laughs> well, that's interesting because, uh, you know, I've heard in the, in the past, um, and I, it has applied in many situations, that when a Libra is born to a family, um, that usually the mother and the father almost need a, a reason to reunite them in some way where, you know, like the Libra kind of brings that energy back together. Like maybe Librans are born when the parents are struggling with their relationship or, or, or born when, you know, to cement a relationship. Cause you know, that happens from time to time where, you know, a child comes along and then, Oh, we have to work together <laughs> type of thing. And I don't know how reliable that is. Um, but I have, uh, you know, tested it out among some Libran friends, and it's it's checked out from time to time. So, just throwing that out there. <laughs> oh, for sure. And uh, you, you know, if you if you look at people that have Libra influences in your life, you will notice this theme of of uh, beauty and balance that comes into the equation. It can be it can be a physical a connotation at times. Like, uh, for example, my brother has a cancer rising, so his appearance is a little more directly connected to the moon and the costume she wears. And his moon is in Libra, and he's actually a model. 
Um, so his beauty is something that can be received by a lot of people very well, but he's also like the nicest model that I've ever met. You know, there's like a level of humility. He's like, you know, I just happen to look this way and this is a role that I'm filling. And it's just such a, it's such not an egocentric model's perspective, but that's really interesting to think about. And one of my cousins that's a middle child with a Libra moon is actually the coach of, uh, of a, uh, the University of Chicago, she coaches their uh, lacrosse team. And so she finds balance between members of an organization. And help, And within the family context, you know, she's super funny. She's like the, the cousin that everyone gets along with all the time. No one's ever fought with, like, that, that, that principle of egalitarianism and just finding that wonderful balance is just such a, an innate part of their nature that, oh, my gosh, yeah, I know. Oh, Libra makes me smile. Right? Well, because Libra, as a, as a Gemini Jack rising here, <laughs> you know, essentially Libra is your fifth house. So, uh, you know, I would imagine that anybody that is touching that Libra energy of your chart, um, for the most part, it's going to be a good time. You're going to develop <laughs> that love for it, you know. Um, so that makes sense uh, to me. But, you know, like you're so Libra, you know, because Libra focuses on that compromise, right? And that's why a lot of Libran folks, you know, rising, sun, moon, um, they don't necessarily like the conflict, right? They, they want things to be peaceful, you know, in that Venusian type of sense. Um, and so a lot of times, especially with the, the Libran moons, I would say, they're, you know, they're they're trying to keep the peace, but there's different ways to do that, right? Because sometimes you keep the peace by saying nothing and that's really not helping. <laughs> um, or you keep the peace by actually, you know, getting in there and, you know, saying everything that's, because Libra can, sometimes I say Libra energy, depending on how it works out, can be a little bit of a, a jerk at times because of that kind of back and forth, <laughs> you know, like, yes. let's get it fair, you know. I can see the beauty in everything. <laughs> Great, but if you're trying to draw a comparison, Libra, we have to stack up. We have to, like, you know, compare and contrast a little bit more. And Libra does love to see the beauty of the world, which does um, link back in, in a way on a mundane level to the socialist perspective on a socio political spectrum. I, uh, in college, I did study politics and international um, relations for a while. And I, uh, you know, it is, it is really interesting to see that sometimes the beauty of the ideals of Libra, which are so elevated and so glorious and can reach everyone, how there's a little bit of a level of impracticality with the nature of our universe and how things like to pull things into their gravity and be seen for, for um, uh, their own egoic needs, which, well, which can be selfish, but which also can't be ignored. Because we each have an individual vessel in this lifetime, and we do need to be realistic about those individual needs. So it's really fun to look through history and see the balancing act of countries that try to do the full socialism, mm. where they try to socialize every aspect of every part of their country. And when you do that, you end up getting things like the Soviet Union, where uh, you, they attempted to apply... Um, you know, uh, equality throughout their entire society in every aspect, but it is in the nature of humans, especially when unconscious, to collect unto oneself. It was almost like they turned a blind eye to the solar principle behind the Libra principle. Mm. And it's funny to see also how other countries have had super um, uh, incredible success by socializing certain sectors of their economy where it makes more sense, like education and, dare I say it, healthcare. Oh, dare you. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> education and healthcare are not capitalized, game-based uh, games of economy, right? Like, as soon as you put something into a capitalized model, you say, we're going to have winners and we're going to have losers. And uh, medicine and education are two areas of life where we want to have as few losers as possible. Yeah. And the way to reach that is through more of a more of an equalized uh, model, like what Finland has done recently, like what most of the Scandinavian countries do for their education systems and their healthcare systems work very well for their nations. But other factors of their country, like their economy still play along with the global capitalist market 
because the countries that have withdrawn from the global capitalized market, such as North Korea, the Soviet Union back in the day, uh, Venezuela, they have not done so hot for themselves because it's as though the beauty of the ideal of the higher ruling principle overrode the realism of the human condition. Yeah. And it's the constant, uh, the constant battle of the sun in Libra. How do I shine for others and for myself? Mm, yes. And, you know, because we're talking about air signs here or an air sign where you're working on those ideals and those those concepts and how things, you know, would ideally be in a perfect world. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, that that kind of perfect utopian vision to some extent. And, you know, Libra kind of fights for that, I think, to find that fair middle ground to reach that vision of beauty that that it holds. Um, but. Yes, that doesn't necessarily fit into those earthly economic principles of having to kind of play the game of with the, you know, the rest of the world, like you're saying. And I love that's a great point, because, you know, I definitely uh, align with uh, socialist tendencies, but in the way that you're saying where certain things should be socialized, because, you know, it's not benefiting anybody, but, you know, we can't be okay, so if we're back to that Libran principle, we can't be totally capitalist. Otherwise, you know, there is not that unity. There's not that balance. Um, and, you know, it, people are suffering because of it. And, mm-hmm. I'm, and it's not an accident that that happened. I think there is a bigger scheme, you know, behind it, uh, especially in regards to education, because an educated population is one uh, to be reckoned with, you know. Oh. Um, <laughs> but so I'm, I'm totally with you on that. And I hope that uh, our country at some point will be able to get on that bandwagon that has been sailing for so many years in other countries. Uh, and we're so just behind the game. And that's pr- this is probably a whole other podcast completely. But yes, while please. you're on the topic, mm-hmm. let us. Podcast. We where could. is my soapbox? Wait, let me stand on it right now. <laughs> this is Hyde Park. I'm going to stand on that soapbox. Yeah. Right. I will <laughs> say it to the world. What I think is fair. And that's okay. That's where we're back to Libra because we mm-hmm. have to, we're working towards what's fair and what's balanced. And I think what happens when Libra energy comes around in the year and we notice it every month when the moon gets into Libra because we get a taste of Libra every month with that moon being there and I notice more times than not in the first 10 degrees of Libra you know it's not like the harmony's there it's not like the beauty shows up it's more like oh my god I feel so out of whack and now I have to cultivate that once again Um, and I think that's where we're at with this season is that we are uh, you know, it's not immediate balance. It's more like the awareness of what is out of balance. So then we can, in turn, work towards getting that at the equilibrium. Yes. Yeah. Who are like mm-hmm. beautifully said, darling. I did sort of want. Uh, um, mm, uh, do you want to continue to talk about the Libra energy, or do you want to maybe move on? Because uh, I've had some thoughts, including thoughts about Hurricane Florence. Oh. And it's happening in the sky, which. Um, w- the timing is just on a mundane level is just too freaking perfect. Do perfect. You mind a little bit? Oh no, go go ahead. Let's let's get in there. So last week we had the um, Jupiter conjunct Plu- or the Jupiter Pluto uh, square sextile. Sextile. That's right. So like a moment, a peak moment. Yes, of course, Scorpio, Scorpio Capricorn. Duh. Um, <laughs> of coming together. And what do you think about when you think about the rushing? Uh, uh, aquatic swirling energy of Jupiter meeting the archetypal enormity of Pluto, I often think of hurricanes. Mm. Um, and that was exactly when Hurricane Florence was forming. But I think it's also really beautiful to look at how the astrology is unfolding and how the storm is evolving because we have coming up uh, on like Tuesday, Wednesday, of this Tuesday of this week, Monday, or around Tuesday of this week, we have the, uh, the Uranus and uh, 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 the, the Mars Uranus square square exactly, yes. and so, whoo, uh, Mars and Uranus uh, on mundane levels. The earlier this summer, we had all those fires happening yeah. on the west coast during some of the other Mars uh, Uranus squares that were happening earlier, and uh, 
the mitigating factor here that I see is different was Mercury moving exalted through Virgo and not yet reaching the Kazemi conjunction with the sun. And so we saw tons of efficient planning, FEMA and the government responding ahead of time and preparing on levels for this storm in the East Coast in really efficient ways. People were less fearful because there was a lot of planning happening. There was a lot of stuff going on. But the actual arrival of all this planning to the solar principle of manifestation is going to be just after the storm is really dissipating. Um, but the, uh, the other really cool factor is that the Uranus-Mars square, you know, Mars is this wonderful cutting motion, this cutting action at times. And it, it, the storm has been sort of dispersed. And so the effect of what this enormous archetypal thing that the news media through the Pluto and Jupiter sextile was really focusing on and seeing with a lot of power uh, that we were then able to plan and prepare for super efficiently. It has not worked out the way because the square between Uranus and Mars, of course, is in Taurus and Aquarius. And so what I see there is um, a culminating difficult aspect that will work itself out in a way that no one predicted. Because Aquarius is that which no one can foresee or the rebellious nature of uh, energy. And uh, I don't think that any of the models that were predicted is actually uh, evolving into what the finality of the storm is going to be. And they're now talking about on the news just this morning about how many of these inland areas, while the wind and the hurricane is displaced, there's so much water coming that we won't see the truest effects of the storm in terms of flooding until Tuesday, which is right on the Uranus-Mars. Oh, of course. <laughs> and you're like, oh, so the dispersed storm and how that'll actually manifest and affect people with the harshness of Uranus and Mars is going to be realized right when it goes square, exactly. And it is not looking like any of the, the highly Virgo detailed models that all of the different nations and meteor meteorological associations have been putting forth. Right. Yeah. And, and well, I, don't, I, well, I saw it go, like, I'm surprised that it went, um, you know, being in so many hurricanes, because I'm from Florida, so I've been in my fair share of hurricanes. Um, and I noticed that, you know, everybody's making such a big, you know, to do. And, you know, this, these are important. Storms are important. Um, but as I started to look at it, and it was hitting as a category one, you know, I started to think about, like, so much, you know, so much drama that's put into that versus versus the five, you know, they're both, um, in, they're both, no one wants to be in either one, right? You know, no one wants a big storm coming, but there is something to be said about how it is dispersing as a storm and actually not gathering as much strength as we thought. But I want to play into your Mars square Uranus there in terms of like, you're saying they're planning, you know, getting, um, and getting everything ready, the kind of the FEMA aid and, you know, everything uh, that's, you know, all the ducks in a row, all those Virgo ducks in a row. But, you know, what came out at the same time, too, was the fact that funds were reallocated by, I think, the billions uh, to the ICE program from FEMA. So here we have this Mars square Uranus, you know, and Taurus, this, you know, kind of mo this money sign with the Aquarian principle of like, you know, kind of kind of what's right here. And so this is being brought into the public too. It's like through this preparation and this storm, uh, this storm has increased a storm within our own population by being coming aware of uh, this reallocation of funds and how it really doesn't help us very much and is, a pro uh, and is pushing the agenda that most of us are not for. Um, and yeah, well, I mean, I... Yeah. You know, but I, that's what, uh, you don't always say that, it popped in my mind. Oh, for sure, absolutely. It has uh, sh shown a spotlight on how the toxic masculinity of our culture is not the appropriate social revolution for this time. <laughs> there Mars we go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you know, it's interesting that you say the fires too, because when we the fires back in May, you know, we gotta remember that, um, that, that new moon that had started, that Mars and Uranus, um, began to meet at um, at the 29 degrees of Capricorn and Aries. So there's still that fire. And actually they will, when they meet again, they're gonna meet, um, I wanna say in February of next year, I wanna say the 19th, somewhere around there. And that's gonna be at 29 degrees Aries as well. So uh, there's kind of that fire element that's coming back. And I definitely noticed that if you, uh, if you're on my um, Instagram page at all, I did a little post on Venus Williams, cause she was caught up in some things recently uh, with the whole, 
I know. <laughs> and her chart, Jack, oh my God, it fits into the Mars Uranus square, like, you know, just per, it's, it's perfect. Um, I won't go into it too much here, but you know, if you want to look at that or. <laughs> well, then talk again about aggressive masculinity affecting a social revolution within a dynamic of society that overly aggressive. I, I, I love men. I am, I am a gay male myself. I really love men. But I have <laughs> problems saying that, you know, it was, it, the dude was being like, was treating Venus differently than a lot of these other male tennis players that throw fits on the court sometimes. Like what Venus did is hardly a- Oh, Serena. I don't know if I said Venus. Did I say Venus? Which is so funny, Serena and Venus. They're so like they're calming so names. Sisterly pair. I mean, I'm sure that neither one would be offended to be mistook for the other. I know. But, Right? Equally but, um, as fabri fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so the, uh, poor, poor Serena representing such a, um, uh, representing the female tennis community, uh, she was not treated the same way as uh, the, her male counterparts that get aggressive or um, enraged or have a temper on the court. Uh, which, in fact, what she did is fairly mild compared to a lot of things that we've seen historically. So I, uh, I, I was very glad to see the majority of news media. I didn't see a single story posted that was in support of what that particular referee did. Um, uh, it, it was all basically an analysis of either the culture of tennis and sports and how men and women are treated differently. And I thought that was a really beautiful thing to see in our current society where so many things can be divisive. I saw really a lot of people collectively acknowledging that pattern of behavior in uh, you know, the world of sports as uh, being aggressively Mars. It was aggressively Mars. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, and it's so, it's, it's kind of poetic that right now Uranus um, is on her ascendant. And, we, and a friend of mine, uh, Monica Anna, we were talking about um, uh, Uranus and Taurus being kind of a, you know, a feminine uprising in some respects. And, and Jupiter being in Scorpio is kind of leading that, you know, that, that energy. Um, and there's no surprise to me in, in Serena's chart as well, Jupiter is exactly conjunct her Venus which is that char her chart ruler, you know, like it, it's, it, it was meant to happen on many, many levels. Um, and I just found that perfect uh, because, you know, when we're talking about these aspects like Mars square Uranus, a lot of times the people that are going to represent or bring the energy to the public are going to be living out these patterns within, within the transits for the most part. And she just fell right on in there. And so, Anyways, I kind of dig <laughs> I shifted a little bit there, but um, yeah, well, shifting, you know, basically shifting dynamic is <laughs> essentially you know, <laughs> what we're talking about. And that really fits into the Jupiter sextile with Pluto that happened last week as well, because that's, that's part of that energy too, you know, it's all on there. It is. And, you know, I think that we're part of an, um, uh, we're in part of an ongoing cycle as well because of the Venus retrogrades coming up. Yes. Venus actually won't make it to Jupiter, make it to the gifting healing principle until he crosses into Sag, which tells me that we still, as a cultural, as a culture, we have more work to do in the next 12 year Jupiter cycle to get to the next Jupiter and Scorpio um, before some of the, uh, the fullness of some of the healing that has started now comes to full fruition yeah. because our Venusian collective principle of love cult on a cultural level, brotherly, sisterly love, won't reach the expansive principle of the teacher Jupiter until his next cycle in Scorpio. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, it's something to be said about as we talk about Venus here, you know, going uh, retrograde because we are in Libra season and Libra is ruled by Venus. Venus is currently in Scorpio. So, you know, um, the sun, essentially, when it moves into Libra, it is disposed by Venus, and Venus is in Scorpio, and we'll be doing that retrograde motion. So this particular um, Libran season is going to be very interesting just based on that actual aspect. And, of course, I'm going to have uh, Kelly Surtees on in a couple weeks. She's going to be talking about the – I know. I love her, too. I, know. I can listen to her all day. Um, but she's going to be talking about that as well. So that's, that's an also another point to this – this season in particular, that's a little different than most. Yes, and I think it actually does make this particular Libran season 
a little more sexual than it usually is in the sense that it really is specifically getting more towards romantic partnerships or um, if someone is polyamorous. I have some friends uh, over in Portland that live a uh, polyamorous lifestyle. Um, and uh, I know for certain that their lives at this time are definitely being dominated uh, or they have events coming up on the near horizon where their whole focus is going to be about, you know, their, their loving partners with whom they share uh, physical love. And that is uh, something to be aware of in this season for sure. Um, beyond the usual uh, a woman's magazine diagnosis of, ooh, Scorpio, sexy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> into more of the reality. <laughs> yes. No, it's true. And I think that's going to be a big part of this particular Venus retrograde cycle is we're going to be looking at those, those intimate relationships um, and what's working within partnerships and then coming to agreements when we're back into the Libra phase, um, you know, in relation to that. So I think, yes, this Libra season in particular and the Scorpio one will be very much focused on the partnership dynamic um, and maybe the things that need to change within that or need to open up because, you know, Venus is very receptive energy, right? You know, it's not that directive Mars, like, let's do this and do that, do that. It's more about, oh, I may have to open up to something in order for this, um, you know, this situation to, to change in some way. So that's, yeah, it's a different, total different flavor. <laughs> Um, but you know, let's talk about Mercury real quick because I know, yes, I know you're, I want you to talk about Mercury, Mr. Mercury uh, man. So we got Mercury just speeding along, right? <laughs> I love a fast Mercury, darling. Like Mercury <laughs> is fabulous when he's fast. I myself was born with a very fast Mercury. So all of my Mercury progressions, for example, like my Mercury changes signs. Uh, when I was born, my Mercury changes signs about once every two weeks throughout my life. So that's a really, that's Mercury at his fastest and Mercury loves being fast. Mm -hmm. So when Mercury's moving fast, he's got more intelligence, he's got more drive. He can actually accomplish all of the numerous tasks that he takes on. Uh, he or she, Mercury, I, or Z, I should call it Z. Z. I like Z. <laughs> Mercury is such a, a neutral energy. Um, so Mercury moving this fast in Virgo, <gasps> oh, <laughs> whoa, lucky. It's so beneficial, which is why I absolutely want to share with all of your listeners this uh, Wednesday, the 20th, in the morning, around 5.17, if you're in Mountain Time, the U.S., where I'm at, it's going to be closer to like 5.24 in the D.C. area. Mercury is going to be exactly Kazemi. Virgo is going to be rising. If you have stuff that you want to get done, that you want to get done successfully and fast in business or in organizational areas of your life, please, please, please get up extra early on the morning of the 20th and take an action that is a landmark grounding moment for you in the sphere of life that you want to invite this incredibly efficient, secretarial, fast-moving, accurate energy into. Um, and that is when I, I am actually re, uh, finally... Uh, putting my website back up with all my new services, including my Reiki stuff. And I'll have the electional chart there for all of us astro nerds to look at. Um, <laughs> and I highly recommend that anyone that has anything to get done, that they want to get done with efficiency, with clarity, and with a lot of attention to detail in a way that's meaningful to people, to take advantage of this really um, a fortuitous, uh, lucky, fast mercury in virgo because he be the sun oh. yes i know because you know mercury and virgo are our best friends they like they hang out <laughs> they have no problem hanging out and you know it makes a lot of sense because if we're thinking about uh the conjunction um and it, basically mercury will conjunct the sun two times in its cycle it does a superior conjunction and then an inferior conjunction and we're experiencing the superior one while mercury is direct um and so i find it interesting once we had experienced the inferior conjunction back when we had mercury retrograde in leo um i want to say it was probably like august first ish i said it earlier i said it earlier in my podcast but now i can't remember but it's somewhere in there anyways so we usually come to conclusions at that kazemi point um to which we then uh 
carry those out um, in, in a mercurial cycle to get to this superior conjunction. So I like that, uh, that idea of like really pushing forward right now um, in, in that area, especially when Mercury is fast, it's moving, and we're like basically uh, kind of waxing forward that dynamic that we decided upon during the inferior conjunction. Um, so there is kind of like a like a completion that happens that we're like really pushing forward to and can get what, you know, those agendas in motion. And it's just ripe conditions, right, with Virgo. Absolutely. And, you, you know, with all blessings comes uh, uh, comes uh, an exception or a drawback. And the, the main drawback to Mercury being so fast is that he moves through this so quickly. Like Mercury's <laughs> best time to be is in Virgo. Like that's his, that's that's Z's favorite place to exist, <laughs> and we only get two weeks of it when he's moving this fast. She's moving this this fast, uh, and so that's the only drawback is that um, w there's more efficiency. There's a lot more um, organization and ability to do mercurial things, depending on where Virgo sits in your chart view, of course, and how your Mercury sits. Um, but we do have a more limited window of time frame to take advantage of it versus the retrograde cycles where we have all of this time, but there's more confusion. It's like there's more time, but less specificity and less yeah. accuracy. Um, so there's that wonderful polar like polarity difference of th the moment really is now. It's now. And let's seize the day, girl. Carpet yeah, group. it kind of reminds me of when you were saying that. I just had this image of a, of a train, um, of a train going, and you know, someone running after it, basically. You got to get on that train. You know, you got you to catch up to it. You got to, but if you can get on it, you can kind of ride that <laughs> into the sunset type of deal. And that's, you know, I, I said that earlier in my, my forecast where Mercury, like you're saying in Virgo, this like two week cycle, it's like a, you blink and you miss it type of thing. You know, you got to run for that train and get on it while the opportunity is here. And like you're saying, this week is very much there's an opportunity when that conjunction um, happens, you know, because obviously there's still combustion in the air, you know, like there is that factor whenever Mercury or any planet is near the sun, um, you know, that can cloud things a little bit. But when we get to that exact moment, there is that, like you said, there's that magic <laughs> that's there. Because, you know, Mercury is very much the magician, if we're thinking about, you know, kind of tarot and stuff like that, you know. Um, so yeah, so what are we, what are we manifesting into, into being, you know, the, that intention, you know, putting that finger into the air to, <laughs> um, so yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. And I have a slow mercury, so I don't know what all this fast business is about. I let my moon, I let my fast moon re recover, recover that, uh, slow mercury so that I, I get the moon in with my mercury. I think. That's a very good balance of those principles. Yeah, for sure, girl. But you're yeah. very thorough. You're absolutely very thorough. I mean, Mercury, when he's slower, can be really, de uh, of course, just like when he's fast in Virgo, very detail-oriented. But say if Mercury is moving fast in a more debilitating sign, like in Sagittarius or something mm -hmm. of that nature, yeah. then um, I, the, in that case, the application of the speed would be less helpful, for sure. And I'm sure that you have other mitigating factors on your Mercury that make it more efficient. Though. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm like Jupiter, but I don't know. Uh, Jupiter kind of blows it up a little bit. I think it's the, you know, it will basically what happens is my Mercury and Jupiter uh, sextile Mars, which then squares Saturn and Virgo. And so if you want to see where the details come from, you know, that's, so that's where they're all happening. <laughs> that Virgo land. Um, so yeah, we're basically speeding through with Mercury. We got the Mars square Uranus dynamic that we were talking about, um, you know, and the seasonal shift where things are literally uh, changing. Um, and uh, we're, you know, we're, we're coming to a completion in many, in many ways, because we were talking about with the equinox um, and Libra in general, we're talking about the harvest, right? right. Um, and we have this harvest moon that is coming along the way uh, for Monday, um, the, what day is that? Why can't, where's my, where's my ephemeris? <laughs> <It's laughs> Always got to have that ephemeris on. Always. Your I need it like on my hip. Like I need a little pack, like a fanny pack that just holds an ephemeris. Um, <laughs> but yeah, on Monday the 24th. So it'll be next week's podcast that it will hit. But I was just wanting to talk about it with Jack for a little bit because, you know, we're waxing towards that all week. And that's, uh, 
a, a full moon in Aries, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. And every, every time there's a full moon, definitely think back cyclically in your mind to where the new moon happened for you. And that would have been uh, the week of April 15th to the 20, uh, to the 20, uh, second, uh, earlier this year in spring. So think back to your April and what was happening for you personally in your life in April then and where Aries falls for you in your chart. So for example, April, actually that was when I bought my ticket for UAC, which is where I met you Yay. and with my, and, and a whole bunch of other wonderful people, uh, my friends Adi, our mutual friend Aditi and George and uh, Nancy that you had on t talking yeah. about Scorpio, um, uh, yes, and uh, that's actually the week that I bought my ticket for UAC. And the new moon in Aries coming up is actually a culminating sequence of I like I just saw DT. I'm having our second follow up on the podcast with you. I uh, just uh, just to use personal examples to elucidate a trend. Um, just uh, got hired to be a, the new a new member of a yoga studio. Um, all of these things because of networking. I have Gemini rising, so Aries is in my. 11th house, mm. all of these opportunities that arose from networking from a single choice that was made back in the Aries new moon is coming to final fruition now, uh, now I, 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 I timed with the Aries full moon. So definitely look at your chart. If you are less familiar, get to an astrologer, talk to Mel, talk to me, talk to uh, your favorite astrologer about what this means for you, because it'll really help to open your eyes to the lunar cycles. And um, that's really one of the most powerful manifestation tools, I don't know about you, that I've noticed um, in terms of setting intentions and having actual things happen. Yeah, because there is that six-month six point um, that, you know, it, it literally has to, it, it waxes in itself to get to that full moon and through these full moon cycles, or, or new moon and full moon, just basically the moon cycles. Um, and when I think back to that time of the new moon in April, that's when I launched my podcast. I launched it on... <laughs> I launched it on the new moon in, in Aries. Um, and yes, it's, it's coming definitely full circle in many ways. I feel like I'm starting to gain some traction, um, in, in my endeavor. Uh, and I definitely appreciate anybody that's listening out there because you know, that, um, helps me keep going and then developing it further. And so, um, really I'll just throw that out there right now. If people want to see some different things or want to see some certain topics or certain people or, you know, what have you, you know, throw it my way because, um, you know, I'm, we're waxing forward here. <laughs> yes. You have Aries in the sixth house, correct? Is That's Scorpio? correct. Yes. This is all about things that have become part of your daily habits and your personal routine making, becoming manifest. Yeah. And this is routine for you now, girl. You are in the swing of it. Uh, even in terms of yoga practice, you know, they say 90 days, 90 days or three months of a practice ingrains it in your behavioral patterns. And you are far beyond that point. This has absolutely been worked into your self-identity. And I think it's so beautiful. You've been expanding so wonderfully. The shout out from Chris Brennan on the astrology podcast. Hi, Chris. The, uh, <laughs> all these fabulous guests you've had on, Cassandra Tyndall. You're getting Kelly on, soon Kelly Surtees. I mean, things are just happening for you because of this change you've made to your annual routine, to the yes. things you do every week, like no. clock. Yeah. And well, you know, and I like to always look at the sun placement too, because I really feel that, you know, the rising and the house setup and all that is incredibly important. But I always like to look at the house in relation to the sun too, because I feel like we live kind of two stories simultaneously. And if you think about me being a cancer sun, Aries puts that as a 10th house placement to my sun. Um, and so, you know, so we're looking at that sixth house emphasis within, you know, the, um, the way the chart is set up, but with that solar principle, we're activating, um, that 10th house of reputation and career when Aries is hit, uh, for me. So that's, you know, it's, it's the two kind of together and yeah, I think it's, I think it's working out rather nice and I'm more than happy with how it's progressing. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but this new, but I have to say though, this full moon, you know, we have some serious things oh, going on here. <laughs> what? <laughs> we have some serious problematic aspects. <laughs> well, well, we do, because we do have this, you know, that the sun and the moon, um, in opposition are in a nice, 
lovely little T square with uh, Saturn and Capricorn. Mm -hmm. um, the moon is also conjunct Chiron. If you're a Chiron follower, it is right on in there. Um, and we, lest us not forget that, you know, the full moon ruler for an Aries moon is Mars. So we're back to that Mars square Uranus energy and Mars being an Aquarius as being much, very much a, um, an aspect of this full moon. Well, one really helpful dynamic of those aspects that I see in you is how you are making grounded and manifest Saturn in Capricorn, uh, how you are revolutionizing like your own personal contribution to the revolution of society. And uh, that has been in a large part, I think, through this work that you're doing through the podcast that you've established. So I think that you in particular have embraced a very healthy version of the energy that's coming up. Not to say that you won't have any mundane manifestations that are, you know, that you won't have problematic mundane <laughs> That are irritating and Marshall related, because Lord knows my Mars and my chart and I... <laughs> <Ugh>. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'll be honest. I know. I know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So, you know, we do have those things to, to keep in mind um, that there is that kind of Saturnian principle. Um, and then next week we have Sun Square Saturn as well. And I'm going to have a, a lovely gal named Evelyn Von Zuhl, who from Joshua Tree come on and we're going to talk about a little bit about Saturn. So we'll kind of save all our Saturn uh, <laughs> stories until that next podcast. But, you know, I mean, is there anything in particular that you see for this full moon in Aries that sticks out other than, you know, kind of the culmination of um, the story that was born in April, which I think is dead on, you know, obviously. We're both manifesting it and living it. <laughs> oh, for sure. I do see, I mean, there are going to be some problematic um, uh, configurations specifically uh, in how our um, intention for manifesting moon in Aries, full moon in Aries, comes up comes up to uh, uh, the, the wall of what society is gonna allow us to establish with our resources at this time. So we might see a few roadblocks in terms of uh, securing finances to establish a business. We might see some roadblocks in our uh, constructed social circles of friends that might find certain things that you're doing to be outlandish or to be too aggressive um, and then the need to realistically maybe dial back or change the way we, or our phrasing of how we're asserting ourselves um, because of uh, social blocks and uh, structural pressures. But because the, um, uh, especially because the Saturn is in cap and the moon is in Aries, Saturn is in the overcoming position. Mm -hmm. So we really might feel like we are hitting a wall for a hot second during this full moon. Um, but it is still a full moon. So there's a lot of optimism there that, and a lot of light that can combat a little bit of Saturn's darkness. But it, I, I, we must warn the listeners that it could feel, at least in the moment of the full moon, that the darkness is insurmountable or overtaking the light in that moment. But of course, that's just another speed bump on the cycle. So keep yeah. that in mind as well. Yes, yeah, so I think that's a very astute observation, Jack. And it makes a lot of sense because, um, you know, if we think about Aries and that, uh, when we think about Aries and cardinal fire, you know, it's moving, it's going, it's impulsive, it can get a little aggressive. It's going to go after what it is it wants. And if we're at cross purposes, you know, with that square type of energy with Saturn, you know, especially if we're a little impulsive in our actions, um, you know, they may work against you in a way of like, even like really mundane stuff, like, uh, you know, the law or, or the authority, you know, but that Saturn square, you know, say someone is, you know, you get a, say you start speeding on the highway because someone, you know, made you a little bit angry or you just hit the gas pedal, you know, and then all of a sudden you go, whoop, whoop, you know, <laughs> and, then, and then the cops there to pull you over and be like, ah, no, you can't, <laughs> you can't quite react that way. Um, and so that's, I mean, that's a very simple type of thing. Um, like, like I liken it too. It's easier to act, but it's, you know, you're, you're more likely to get busted <laughs> in a way. <laughs> well, exactly. And Playing exactly along that point, it is a time, for example, I do most of the work that I do is of a private contracting nature. And so because of that, I am an individual like many citizens that I actually pay my taxes quarterly because that is more manageable and uh, uh, more um, 
uh, easy to budget for than if you do annual taxes, because for private contracting, you tend to accrue more. Um, so your quarterly taxes are actually going to be due right at the end, <laughs> right with the beginning of the new quarter. So make sure you pay them on time, darling, if you are someone like me that pays their taxes quarterly. Um, the, the things like the IRS, systemic uh, institutions that are here to make sure you follow regulations are going to be really on top of their shit. Uh, oh, excuse my French. So um, sure that you're on, on the ball for a, you are for checking your boxes at this time. Yeah, because it, uh, a slippage will be less forgiven. Yes, I think that's absolutely yes, 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 yes. <laughs> um, and well, yeah, but we but we have to get those. We have to kind of play by those rules and get things in line. I think that's where that Libran principle of balance um, and fairness and what is happening is going to be essentially what you know is coming to the consciousness within the full moon because you know the something has to light up a full moon, right? And that's the sun. So even though the the emotional self and the reactionary self, the subconscious self is working on that area principle, you know, really the the nugget of awareness lies in in Libra land. Um, and so we kind of got to balance that out. <laughs> yes, and I think that the, that the, every year when we get the sun in Libra and we get that full moon in Aries, that is the moment at the apex of what we were talking about at the very beginning of our conversation. How does my light in this situation, the moon in the, the sign of Aries, how does how do my uh, how does my emotional, heartfelt uh, heart chakra centered self align with how my light is meant to shine for everyone else too. That's that the apex of that moment. And then in this particular case, that extra square thrown in there with Saturn adds the societal component of Capricorn in there. How do I shine for others in a heal in like in a healing, meaningful, kind, beneficent way while being self responsible to my own needs, Moon and Aries and also meeting the limitations of the society that I live in. And so that's a very, uh, it, it's a very literal manifestation of what we were talking about at the very beginning of the conversation. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's very good because, you know, if we think about Aries just in general, it's that I am principle, you know, it's, who am I? Who am I in relation to the other? Libra. Who am I in relation to in society? Capricorn. You know, um, and so, and I think we've done a lot of working on that over the last summer, you know, our retrograde summer, as we're calling it now, because we've had so much time to go within and figure out what the hell we're doing with our lives, you know, what the part wants, how we fit in with, you know, the world at large. And now, it, it, you know, in terms of the harvest moon and the idea of fall being um, a point of completion, we are apexing to the completion of an aspect of ourselves in some way so that then we can embody the next I am. And I think within that, we need those restrictions of Saturn. We need those lines that we're going to draw in order to be like, I'm not this anymore. I am now going towards that. I'm going to restrict myself here so that I can then become that. Um, and I think that that's where that Saturnian principle can come in and be uh, helpful for us more so than, you know, getting pulled over and getting a ticket, you know. <laughs> But those are just some thoughts. <laughs> For sure. It was beautifully said, Mel. And it actually, in terms of a literary reference, this dynamic of full moon and Aries opposing the Libra and Sun square Saturn, it reminds me of the moment when Scrooge in A Christmas Carol, when he wakes up after the third ghost and realizes, oh, I can live for myself within the structure of the business that I've built and I can shine for others too. Ah. Like, it's that moment of when Saturn... Um, because it's squaring both uh, both luminaries, there is actually, I think, a little bit of an uh, a, of a warmth because Saturn is going to be squaring the moon, overcoming that. But then the sun is in an overcoming square to Saturn. So if we can get in touch with the, the more Libran principle of I mean, a little bit of a weaker square, but uh, if we can get in touch with the Libran principle a little more of uh, uh, shining best. Uh, uh, for others in, in a very egalitarian way, that is how we can overcome uh, the darkness that, uh, that is implied by Saturn squaring an Aries aggressive full moon. Yeah, no, I think that's good. And, you know, it's, it's, there's something to be said about it happening so early in the cycle because we haven't had time to situate ourselves into the energy of, of Libra yet in particular. Um, so I think this will be a bit of a wake up call in regards to our Libran story um, for this particular year. And I'm excited to see what it brings um, because, you know, hey, 
that's what life's all about, right? You know, roll with the punches. <laughs> Mm. Yeah. So, all right, Jack. Well, we have talked with, we've said some wonderful things here today and I'm so glad you have joined me. I am, you know, you are definitely going to be back if I, you know, and yes, I love Jack. Everyone knows. Oh, that. I love him. <laughs> all right. So let's remind people where you're going to be found, where that website is relaunching and all things uh, Gemini Jack. Perfect. Well, my website is GeminiJack.com. You can reach me at GeminiJack at gmail.com. Um, and uh, I can be found, uh, if you're in the state of uh, Virginia, Northern Virginia, near DC, you can find me teaching yoga at uh, uh, Lotus City, which is a brand new studio in Lovettsville, Virginia. Um, I'm also uh, subbing in a few studios right now. And uh, I do a charity event once a month over in um, uh, Arlington uh, that raises money for pet adoption. It's called Puppy Yoga. And we have live puppies available for adoption that will run up and kiss you while you're in Downward Dog. And I have wonderful students taking pauses to get selfies with the dogs. It's just, it's, it's a fabulous event. It's so much fun. Oh, I love that. And that's so perfect for Libra because, you know, there's a lot of association with Libra and, and, and dogs um, to some extent, you know, because if you, there's that loyalty and that companionship and, you know, the, who, your dog's your best friend, right? Oh, I'm, I love that you do that, Jack. That's so sweet. Oh, I have a killer. I mean, it's just a killer time. And everyone is so appreciative at the end. You just, you leave on such a high. Everyone talk about Libra and bringing light to everybody. Like everyone leaves like floating on air from puppies and yoga. Like they're just. <laughs> I love it. Puppies and yoga. What's not the like? It's like goat yoga. You know, there's that. <laughs> have you heard about that? Go yeah, there's a goat, goat yoga people do. It's crazy. <laughs> Oh. Yes, so I, I'm doing those things. Uh, I do ter uh, tarot and astrological consultations. Um, I really have uh, been expanding that since uh, I worked at Floyd Fest, music, a wonderful music festival, uh, earlier this summer. I'm getting a lot of beautiful clientele from all over the East Coast and some of the Southern states, which I haven't had as much contact with in my life. So it's been really beautiful to hear these stories and to talk with people about their lives in uh, different social contexts. Than, um, than I've known where I've lived by coastally and uh, it's just been really heartwarming you know and everything is uh, everything's really moving forward for businesses as one of my clients said this week you know Saturn just went direct and so did I <laughs> <laughs> that's funny it's true it's so true too you know uh, yeah and I'll throw that out there in relation to our full moon chat you know us cardinal signs us Aries Cancer Libra and uh, Capricorns are really going to be feeling it <laughs> I think um, as we have this full moon so I wonder if your client was a cardinal representative um okay, he's a triple cancer or, okay well then there we go <laughs> i want to be as vague as possible but yes yeah. absolutely. yeah that's all i needed that's all i needed to put that point home <laughs> i love it so i'm gonna have all those links so that you can reach jack you'll be able to get those through my my blog post so that you guys can connect with him because i highly recommend it if you want to that Leo moon just shines and it will warm your heart as much as their stories warm your heart you're a heart warmer you know, you're, you're helping be that catalyst for that energy. So uh, I'm so glad that you're available to connect with people. So I'll have all that up on my blog post, um, which you can find, uh, you can find me at energeticprinciples.com. Um, and you can find me on Facebook and uh, Instagram, uh, more so on Instagram, on at Energetic Principles. I, like Jack, also do consultations. I do them here in San Diego, and I can do them via Zoom uh, anywhere in the world. So if you'd like to set something up like that up, I do something called uh, Tarot Meets Astro, where I combine the tarot and astrology together to kind of work with issues in the moment in relation to transits and progressions and stuff along those lines. Um, so if you're interested in that, please read reach out. Um, and if you're interested in the tarot subscription, speaking of tarot, uh, and my moon horoscopes, which of course I'll be having some come out for this Aries full moon, um, you can find me on Patreon at uh, patreon.com backslash energetic principles. And all those subscription options also get you early access to the podcast, which is always nice, you know, to get a day in there, you know, if it's Sunday, Sunday, fun day, podcast day. <laughs> uh, so you can get that just if you want to sign up. 
Um, and if you like what you hear today, you know, me and Jack talking it out, you know, I sure did, you know, share it with a friend. Uh, sharing is caring, especially in Libra season. So we want to get that out there. Um, and if you feel so inclined to give me a nice rating on iTunes, I will not object because it really helps, uh, you know, these efforts to be seen. Um, so, you know, after all that spiel that I have, <laughs> get that out there. I want to thank Jack so much for joining me today. I, you're such a pleasure. The, ple the pleasure was mine, Mel. Please. No. No. <laughs> please. Please. All right. Well, we'll leave everybody with that. Um, and thank you so much for tuning in. And until next time, may the stars be with you.